we can start. Welcome, everybody. It is my great pleasure to introduce today Ugo Mundini, who is a British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow in the Faculty of Medieval and Modern Languages at the University of Oxford. After obtaining his PhD at the University of Milan in 2021, he was a researcher at the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna, and then a Marie Curie Postdoctoral Fellow at the Department of Linguistics of Kant. He is still affiliated with the ERC project Meda, that is uh, the meaning of language, a digital grammar of the Greek taught at school in late Constantinople. Ugo is a specialist of ancient and medieval Greek literature and language, and in particular grammar, metrical and rhetorical treatises. His current uh, project focuses on the teaching of Greek grammar in the 11th century through skitography. He's currently working on a monograph on John uh, Mauropus and on the publication of the corpus of poetical writings of this 11th century Greek poet, who is the topic of the paper that he kindly agreed to deliver today. So, Hugo, thank you very much. The floor is all yours. Well, thank you to your, the organizer of Tetra for this invitation. And if I can, I would uh, share my PowerPoint. Okay, I should have the possibility. Okay, do you see it? Okay, perfect. So today I want to share some reflections that stem from one of my projects on medieval Greek literature, and I think may have some broad implications for the studying of coeval literature in other languages. My talk focuses on the author I have studied since the beginning of my PhD at the University of Milan, Johannes Mavropoulos. I'm currently, as Georgia said, working on the whole edition of his poems and a monograph on his poetry. Therefore, it is self-evident that for me, Mavropoulos was on, not only the object of my study, but also the tinder for broad questions shaping some of my current research trajectories. At the end of my talk, I will leave some open questions that I hope will serve as a source, a source for debate uh, on pre-modern literature, Greek or non-Greek, in our case, on poetry. I will also share some good news about something that will come into being from next January onward. In the 11th century Byzantine Empire, in a literary landscape that may seem to be dominated by the prominent figure of Mikhail Pselos, other fascinating authors operated. operated. One of them is Ioannis Mavropos, I will give you some snapshots of his biography to understand who we are speaking about and where we are. Avropos was born around the year 1000, and he was nephew of the Bishop of Clausiopolis in Anatolia, the man who funded his early education and supported his career. Later on, we find him part of the patriarchal clergy, a diacon of the Church of Theotokos Kalkopratia in Constantinople. In the meantime, he was giving private teaching at his house and among his disciples, he had Mikhail Pselos. Then we find him as a writer very close to Constantinos IX Monomachos, who reigned between 1042 and 1055. Under his patronage, Mavropos wrote a number of diverse texts. In 1049-1050, he was appointed as a bishop of the important yet peripheral city of Eochaita in Anatolia. Mavropos describes this post as the, in the necessity of living far away from Constantinople as an exile. Should we trust him? This is a question for another paper, perhaps. But during his, type, his time as a bishop, something massive happened. The Battle of Panzinkert of 1071 and the subsequent issues that Byzant Byzantine had with the Normans of Roussel de Barieu and the Seljuks in, Celtra, in central Anatolia. These events disrupted the living and the activities of many individuals linked to the empire, including Mavropus. Therefore, shortly after 1071, Mavropus returned into Constantinople and asked to retire to a monastery. Despite some opposition, he managed to obtain what he requested and became a monk in the monastery of Prodromos Petra. He lived there and continued to compose literature until at least 1082, when we lose trace of him. Mavropus wrote texts in every primary form of medieval Greek production. By him, we have 177 sorry, poems in prosodic dodecasyllable, including a didactic poet on, poem on etymologies, 77 epistles, 14 orations, and a considerable amount of hymns. 
in the in the Greek Middle Ages, sorry, in the Greek Middle Ages and nowadays in Greek Orthodoxy, he has been known, Mavropus, mainly for two reasons. As the inventor of the feast of the three hierarchs, as you can see from the slide, a fresco from Mistra on a vision he allegedly had, and a, as a composer of hymns. But in modern academic scholarship, he has been in the spotlight for two reasons. For an epigram on Plato and Plutarch in Prosody to the Casillable, a Byzantine verse in the, in the case of Mavropus with a prosodic pattern consisting in an alternation of long and short vowels, and for the manuscript that saved his production, highbrow production, namely the Vaticanus Grecus 676, and the implication it had on what we read from Mavropus in this Vatican collection. As for many Byzantine authors, the transmission of this part of his production in highbrow literature was hanging on by a thread. In our case, a single manuscript that was copied under the direction of Maropus in the 11th century. A part of this manuscript was later copied during the reign of Alexios I Komnenos and then in the 15th century. Luckily, we have both 11th century manuscripts and these copies. As Daniele, as Daniele Banconi demonstrated in 2011, the Vatican manuscript was written under the supervision of Ioannis himself. In other words, Mavropos decided not to limit the life of his poems to the occasion for which they were written, otherwise they would have come to us scattered into several manuscripts and according to serendipity of the case. Just as Mark Lauksterman, I suppose that the manuscript was copied in Ohaita and then brought to Constantinople, when it when it, where it stayed until the end of the 14th and the 15th century. Afterwards, it somehow came to Crete and at the end entered the Biblioteca Apostolica Vaticana. On this slide, you can see the pinnax of the manuscript. Before it, Two poems introduce the key events of Ioanni's career, the, from being a deacon, new nephew of a metropolitan, metropolitan bishop, to his election as a metropolitan bishop. And then the meaning of the collection, the time has changed and so did the literary tastes of the audience. Therefore, Ioannis wanted to preserve his own works for the future with the fear that no one will appreciate them. As shown by the Pinax, the works are divided into three groups, the poems, Sticky Diaphory, the epistles, Epistole Diaphory, and the speeches, Lohi Diaphory. In all three groups, the adjective Diaphoros refers to the diverse content that the, these works cover. After this section, at the title of each, of each oration is reported. Why not also the title of the 99 poems and the 77 epistles? Is it not only a matter of conciseness? The poetry book and the epistle of Mavropus are a single unit for many reasons. They create two narratives macrostructures, which are manifestly highlighted as such through decorative patterns within the manuscript, but we do not have time to go into detail on this. On this slide, you can see how Mark Lauksterman left and Floris Bernard right reconstructed the narrative macrostructure of the poetry book. Sorry for the Italian on the right. I would have minor additions, clarifications, and adjustments to make to these reconstructions, and therefore I rule them out from the current presentation. What I want to stress here is that, that, is, is that the two interpretations do not contradict it, each other. On the contrary, Mavropus follows two criteria in reorganizing his poems. The purpose that the text had when it was written, for instance, to be inscribed as an epigram on a work of art, and then the role that each, that each text plays within the poetry book in reconstructed Mavropus' biography through its deeds as a poet with which accompanied his public life, to build a coherent self-representation in modern terms. The macro stru structure, however, is not based only on the contents, and to use again a modern term, the genre of the, po of the poems. First of, first of all, it creates a, books, a book within a book, I mean, a, a poetry book within the manuscript, the Vatican manuscript. On the one hand, poem one is the preface to the collection. On the other, the juxtaposition of the three poems recreates the setting of the end of the book 
I mean poem 97 to 99. Then there are poems that contribute to the creation of the macrostructure and which are also relevant from the point of view of content. I'm talking, for example, of poem 14 on the three hierarchs painted together and of poem 86 on the icon of the three hierarchs donated by Mavropus. These two poems on this very relevant topic for Mavropus himself are res respectively the 14th poem from the beginning and the 14th from the end. Other similar matches can be found within the collection. But beyond that, there is also a balanced arrangement of, of the poems in terms of the content and length, which I will not describe, describe here in detail. The poetry book in the Vatican manuscripts is indeed magni a magnificent, sophisticated piece of literature. And so is the epistolary, as Anselkovich, Lauksterman and Maltese have recently pointed out. As for the poetry book, it seems to be very rare evidence of such a collection in Byzantine literature. I mean such a structure collection, uh, collection, but research on Byzantine poetry books is yet to be conducted despite some efforts in recent past. But while we are all captured by the marvel of this work of art, it is my role to mention the famous elephant in the room of our discussion. Let's go back to slide four. By Mavropus, we have also a long poem on etymologies in dodecasyllables, but outside the Vatican collection. If the poem is to be ascribed to Mavropus, as I tend to believe, it still awaits both a full edition and a study, despite its form, prosodic dodecasyllables, as the poems in the Vatican collection, its content, education, a trend in our current uh, discussion of Byzantine studies, and it its interesting topic, etymology. On the slide, you can find a visual example of, of how the poem appears on the manuscripts in the typeset from my own edition. However, among the things that Mavropus wrote in his life, the group that really stands out are the hymns. As I told you before, Mavropus is a renowned hymnographer in Orthodox, in Orthodox Christianity. We have several manuscripts, among them the ones on this slide, the Theologicus Grecus 78 in Vienna, a manuscript in the Mehisti Lavra and in Vatopedi on, on Mount Athos, an important manuscript in Paris, the Parisinus Grecus 138. The number of texts is impressive, 160 hymns, according to the Utus's Tayuto account. Among them, 25 hymns on Christ, 68 canons on the Theotokos, 11 canons on St. John the Baptist, a series, series of eight canons for St. Peter, St. Paul, St. John Chrysostom, and St. Nicholas, and then a couple of canons or single canons for specific other saints. Still, despite the seminal works by Enrica Foliere and Francesco D'Aiuto, these aims still await a comprehensive study be it monographic on single canon series or comprehensive on the whole production. In this sense, I'm very happy to know that Zimostenis Kaklamanos is working on the edition of the canons, or at least of the Theotokarion. Despite good editions Italian and Italian translations of some hymns, the only English translation of the Mavropus's poetry currently available only covers the Todecasyllabic poetry from the Vatican manuscript. Let me be clear. The problem does not lie only in the hymnographic nature of this poetry, I mean the meter, as it is a matter of context in addition to the text form. Apart from Avropus, the production of a poet from the first half of the 11th century, Christophorus Mytileneos, has undergone the same fate. The secular poetry, secular, from the famous manuscript now, is in, now in Grotta Ferrata, has two very good editions and has been translated in both into Italian and English, very good translations. As for Christophorus calendars, we still rely on the solid editions and translations by Enrica Folieri and Ivan Duicer. These calendars are not only in hymnographic meters, but also in ancient meters, so-called ancient. The standard reference to 11th century Byzantine poetry is nowadays writing and reading Byzantine secular poetry 1025-1081 by Floris Bernard, 
published in 2014. This wonderful book has enhanced our knowledge of context of production and fruition of secular poetry during the 11th century and offers the essential tools to grasp both the conception of poetry and the mindset of intellectual elites. However, what immediately stands out in this book is the delimitation of the general topic, Byzantine secular poetry. This definition is evidently meant to follow the most traditional classification in the field of Byzantine studies and recalls the distinction between the three different volumes of the Byzantine issues handbook. On the one side, the two by Hans Georg Beck, respectively on church and vernacular literature. On the other, the one on high register literature by Herbert Hunger. Bernard is aware of the significance of his choice in delimiting his own subject and offers more than a satisfactory explanation in his introduction. With regard to the adjective secular, he says the following, I quote, hymnographic poetry was composed in 11th century by Christoph Christophorus and Mavropus, and it should not be forgotten by poets of living in monastic communities in southern Italy. However, hymnographic poetry would require a separate study to deal with questions of function, circulation, and the like, which are, I believe, quite different from those of secular poetry." Unquote. Bernard, Bernard is totally right, and his choice is fully reasonable within the economy of his book. In 2014, the subject would have, been, be, would have become sorry, unmanageable if he had decided to include hymnography. But it is a matter of fact that after nine years, we still await a similar book for non-secular poetry, which I hope it is in the making. Although, for instance, Bernard rightly says, it would be a mistake to give the impression that vernacular and liturgical poetry are words apart from learned secular poetry. On the contrary, there was permeation between these categories of poetry, categories which are created post factum in any case, the fact alone that some poets were active in several of these categories is indicative of this, unquote. This is true, and the lack of wide-range analysis on Byzantine non-secular poetry unavoidably affects our understanding of medieval Greek poetry as a whole. Byzantines, whoever they were, and I use this term in the most traditional sense of the meaning, clearly considered hymnography as a form of poetry. People knew and learned hymns at church, at school, and their life was marked by chanting, repeating, and writing these texts. Their acquaintance with hymnographic meters began when they were children. For instance, it is for this reason that teachers used hymnographic meters to compose poetry, to make students memorize difficult grammatical rules. Hymnographic poetry was deeply studied and commented as any other form of literature, as the commentary by Stasius of Thessaloniki and other scholars clearly show. However, this type of poetry is very hard to use as a historical or a theological, theological source. On the one side, it seemingly does not represent clear evidence for the context, and if it does, it, of, it is often not explicit within the text. On the other, it rarely conveys theological content that is not already known from elsewhere. Going back to Mavropos, the canons are a marvelous piece of Byzantine literature, and I wish I had the time to delve into their linguistic and poetical beauty. What I can say is that they match with the same literary refinement and the conceptual depth, depth of many other works by Mavropos. They are only different in a Greek that seems to be more accessible and lowbrow and without the form of prosodic dodecasyllabic poetry. As for the context, Francesco D'Aiuto rightly underlines that it's, that it's very difficult to relate the composition of Mavropus's monographic corpus to a precise period of his life. It is very likely that most of them were written when he became a monk, so after 1073. But in this period, as a bishop of Eochaita, but sorry, but is in his period as a bishop of Eochaita, he also probably wrote hymns. We have three hymns on Saint Theodore, the Saint, the Saint that was worshipped in Eochaita. And we have a passage from the speech that Mikhail Pselos wrote around 1055 to persuade Ioannis to remain bishop of the city and go back there. In this passage, there is a wonderful description of the community of Eochaita and Ioannis' ability in making everyone be part of the celebration. 
he explained everything to people. Hymns were instrumental part of his process of this process, and he selected an ordered of old hymns and composed new ones. See the, high, the part highlighted through the canons composed by the bishops, the, by their, their bishop, people from Urheita became accustomed to the theological content of canon. To sum up the question, what to do with poetry? In my monograph on Mavropus's poetry, I want to offer a comprehensive overview on how 11th century author composed poetry and what was the difference in composing, presenting and transmitting literature in different forms. For instance, the difference between a poem and an epistle, but just for instance. To this end, I am proceeding in the following way, which may not be revolutionary, but I believe it is effective. First, considering the form, language, meter, rhythm, a medieval Greek author decided to write in a certain way and interfaced with certain norms, be them linguistical or literary. They choose a language or mixed various forms, how highbrow, lowbrow, vernacular, medieval Greek. In presenting their texts, they played in the shared ground where composition has to meet the expectation of the public and its favor through literary beauty and effectiveness. And to do so, author could act also in a very subtle way. Here on the slide, you can find the only place in Mavropus' Vatican poetry book where there is a yambic verse made of all long syllables, a metrical monstrosity seen with the eyes of ancient literature. On the contrary, it is a preciousness by Mavropus to wink at the, his erudite readers or listeners. But if, if we go from ancient prosody to rhythm, we should keep in mind that it is the purpose of any author to make their poetry sound good, to have a tree with leaves and fruits as described by Planuthis in the passage on the slide. And then, to go back to my way of addressing poetry, the function of each text has to be considered on, this, on its own, and as syntagmatic part of a broader discourse if we are in cases similar to Mavropus's poetry book. A text may have, and often it has, more than one function from the, from the moment of composition to the moment, moment in which it is read by us. Reconsidering the plurality of this function and context is a good in engine for new studies on audience and readership in, of literature in Greek Middle Ages. Finally, poetry, as a marked discourse in comparison with prose. Without the form, the meter, the rhythm, the rules underlying poetry, there is no difference from prose. And this is a starting point. Furthermore, prose and poetry are often intertwined in Byzantine texts, as Zaklas demonstrated, for instance. Is there a difference between a prose text, a poem, and a text with both? But if we look more generally to what we consider poetry in pre-modern world, these questions merge with other more general ones. For instance, what is labeled as poetry, why and by whom? How can we foster a dialogue between different medieval traditions of poetry? How, into brackets, within brackets, should we approach poetic language and forms comparatively? Which roles do orality and materiality play in composing, accessing, transmitting poetry? What was the role of individuals, communities, networks? How? should we translate poetry? The good news, to address this, these and more questions, I am very happy to announce that there is a new network that will set start from January 2024 in Oxford, thanks to the support of the Torch and the John Fell Fund. It is called Poetry in the Medieval World. We will organize a fortnightly reading group, workshops, plenty of events in person, in hybrid form and online. If you are interested, contact me and for now, Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ugo, for your um, interesting and exhaustive presentation of uh, uh, this author. We open now uh, our Q&A, so please just write in the chat or raise your hand if you have a question. I see Albert has a question already. Is there also, thank you for your contribution. Is there also something known about the melodies they were sung? 
Sorry, I, I didn't. Uh... The melody of the hymns. Ah, the the melody. Melody. Yes, 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 you're right. You're totally right. And the problem with the melody there is that uh, it's a twofold problem. The first one is that Byzantinists, as my as myself, are not trained to understand the melody if they, they do not study it, the first point, the first problem. The second problem is that we don't have the melody. For instance, for Mavropos, it's very hard to reconstruct it because it, there is no notation on the manus manuscript. Oh, that yeah. was my question also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a very challenging topic and it's very important to have this in mind. And are they still some? In, in uh, I think I think some of them are are used yes. because they could enter the, the text. This could be a good it. starting point then. Yeah, 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 yeah. But thank you. And is there a connection with uh, others, uh, Romanos, the melodist? Uh, they wrote they wrote in different meters. But still, it's the same tradition. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, ethnographic poetry. Okay. But yeah, it's a long tradition of poetry in for churches and ethnography in general. And yeah, it's fascinating. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Do you have any other questions? If we don't, I have a question concerning the content. Like, uh, can you uh, tell a bit more about the content of these hymns and, uh, yeah, in general of his uh, poetry? So, um, for the hymns, um, the contents are linked to festivities. So, um, we have um, paraclectic hymns to Christ. They are very interesting and they are also um, uh, published by Enrica Foglieri. Uh, the poems uh, to the Theotokos, they are wonderful. I could only read them on manuscript and I really, I, I'm awaiting um, the, the, the edition by Kaklamanos because it's very, um, they, they are wonderful. They, 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 they show the, the pity towards the Virgin and the use of the Virgin to uh, be between the, uh, the, the one who do the pray and God, and does the pray and God. It's very interesting. And um, as for the poems, um, the poems not in the ethnographic meter, um, they cover all the variety of things that a writer in 11th century could write. For instance, um, there are a lot of poems on work of art, works of art. Sorry, um, to be inscribed. And they are wonderful. They they cover the festivities of uh, of Christ. They cover uh, some saints that could be depicted uh, in in churches and so on. And then we have poems that are more linked to the court and poems to the emperor and poems to the death of the emperor. So we cover all the the variety of things that uh, an author could write at the time. Sorry for my voice. Oh. No, thanks. It was very clear. Thank you. Uh, Mara. Yes. Uh, sorry, I have to keep my camera off. Uh, Ugo, thank you so much. This was fantastically interesting. I have a question that, at least in my field, in my experience, has been helpful when trying to put together all the relevant parts of an author. So my question is about the manuscript tradition. So is it possible to, to put together a picture of the, uh, well, where the manuscripts were produced, but also if they they have been copied in, in a consistent way, if we, if we have gaps in the manuscript transmission, and, and what can we say about the reception of this author by his contemporaries and, and those who came after? Thank you so much. It was super fascinating. Um, so in Forma Propos, we have the best scenario ever so we have a manuscript that was composed under his direction from the first page to the last page and um, every part follows what he wanted in in the manuscript and as i told you during the you all during the during the presentation this manuscript was copied later on in the same century or the beginning of the following center century as part of a, um, of an anthology of poets 
um, end of short texts from an late antiquity antiquity to um, to the time. So we have uh, some uh, hints to the reception of um, of Mavropus in the same period. And then it, it was copied later on uh, by uh, people in Crete as a, stand, a full long-standing manuscript. Um, we have some poems that are scattered around. So we know that there are poems that were uh, circulating more than the poems within the, the manuscript. And as for the hymnographic poets, uh, poems, um, they are all together in some manuscripts. It, it, it is very interesting. The manuscripts they showed you, they are they have the whole collection of Mavropus. Um, and some other poems are scattered again uh, to be used in in uh, in liturgical books. So yeah, it's we have a, a the best case scenario because we can follow the authorship throughout textual tradition in this case. Uh, for other authors, it's not possible. Um, but I think in this case, we can use him, Mavropus, as a case study to understand how the things works in this in this case, and then to see what happens when we have scattered evidence. Yeah, with the caveat that if we look at the whole picture and then we see the scat the scattered evidence, we have to consider that things can go other way that we don't know naturally. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thanks both. We have any other questions? Uh, Georgia, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. This was really fascinating. I learned a lot. Um, I have a question about the letter collection or the letters in general, and especially, well, I was just wondering if you could just tell us more, especially with regards of the question of differences between poetry and prose. Could you expand a bit? Um, yeah. The, the the letter collection by Mavropus is um, again seems to be a unicum, um, but we have to explore more. Um, what I mean is that uh, Mavropus, when he re recollected the letters within the, the, the epistolary, he cut all the beginnings and all the ends of the epistles. And you know that the beginning and the end are the parts um, that are linked to the factuality of the letter so they became something else or they became what was at the at this core point at the core of the letter itself so they kept only the core point of the letter and if you read them and there is a wonderful translation by Carposilos um, of the letters uh, if you read them in a row they create a picture of Mavropus uh, from the time he was uh, active in Constantinople to the time it was active in uh, Efraita. And the general representation is that it was sent off in exile. But I'm, I tend not to trust him for the exile narrative. Mm -hmm. But still, he was sent to exile for his, 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 um, his um, appointment as a bishop of Efraita. But if some, it is something that is very um, important in an epistolary because you know an epistle and epistles are meant to be to create networks and so if you go outside the network or you go outside a place where a network was built in the first place something is disrupted and so you have to speak about it and this is the narrative of, of the exile but i'm working on it and um yeah and for other things um, it is very interesting to see how the Greek of these epistles is constructed. It's very, very interesting. And how there are things that are closer to poetry than to orations. Um, but yeah, they are yet to be demonstrated, I think. Can I follow up? Sorry? Can I follow up? Yeah, yeah. Sure, please. Sorry, I, this is very fascinating what you just said. Um, so if I understand correctly, the fact that we don't have the beginning and the end of the letter, does it also mean that we don't have any ideas as to whom he was writing to? It, it is, and that is a crucial very, very part of letter collections. I know. You, that's, I know. Yeah. And so and do we only have letters that he sent, nothing that he received? Yeah. 
so basically the whole point of creating a letter collection is not exactly so not there it's different um, i mean it's just it's building up a self-representative uh, yeah, sorry i cut you off yeah no 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 it's it's different it's different because um it is a self-representation in a in a sense um but at the same time it's different for instance from the history of aretas of, of caesarea where we have uh, some epistles by others that were part of his letter collection and yeah it's very interesting and it's different for instance from the case of Michael Ypsilos, because Michael Ypsilos, we have a lot of letters, but we don't have evidence, I think, of his regathering of them. So, yeah, they, they became a piece of literature, or they still are a piece of literature as they went, they were meant to be uh, in whatever mean, uh, whatever sense of the mean literature and piece of literature um, and the author conveyed at the time. Great. And aren't they in separate manuscripts? No, no, the same. Okay. No, I mean, uh, only the letter together or together with the hymns or... They are they are in the Vatican manuscript. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, yeah, have, I didn't get we, that. No, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. We have the poems, the letters and the uh, and the speeches. Wow, some, so they... some of them are scattered around also, but everything that is scattered around is to be found in the manuscript. Great. So they really go together. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, Nina. Uh, yes, thank you, Hugo. As always, fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask about the poem on etymology, yeah. uh, as you probably could have guessed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, as I understand it, it is in a in separate manuscript tradition, right? Yeah. So, You're right. I know that the attribution of this poem to um, Mavropoulos is a bit well. Yeah, there's there's arguments for and against. Um, but you mentioned you are on the side of this is a poem of Mavropoulos. Yeah. Could you tell me a bit more about why you think this? If it has like a separate tradition and seeing you know all these other works that he's had and uh, how familiar you are with these poems and his works. So the the, the problem with this poem is that it um, it yeah it is in manuscripts that are very, very late. And um, my point of view is that um, I'm still working on this, on the, on the side of the authorship, but I would, in, a, in an edition, I would put it at, as a dubious and not as, so as, I have a doubt, but mm -hmm. I would not consider it spurious. Um, the problem with authenticity is also linked to the form of this poem because the poem is written in prosodic, prosodic dodecasyllable, so a dodecasyllable which follows the rules of ancient prosody, short, long, short, long, and so on. Um, but the content of the poem, the, the fact of being um, a poem about words and certain words affect affects the um, the prosody. So, for instance, the presence of the Mavropus or the author had to have some words within the verse, and these words disrupt the meter. But it's not it is not a proof that that um, the poem was not well written. It is the case in which a word creates problem within the meter which are acceptable for Byzantines. So the form of the poem will not help us in understand uh, in understanding whether it is by Mavropoulos or not. Uh, the textual tradition would um, would hint at the fact that it could be by someone else. For instance, there is this um, recently ed yeah, edited, I think, um, poem uh, on the guardian angel uh, that was um, attributed ascribed to Mavropus in the 14th century, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, is it is not my, by Mavropus, but um, it is ascribed to Mavropus because Mavropus, for his role in Orthodox in Greek Orthodox Christianity, had was a name at the time. 
but I would not rule out the possibility that this poem, only for the fact that it's very late transmitted and the form of the poem was not um, uh, was not written by Mavropoulos himself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I find I find it a fascinating case because as far I I didn't know a lot about his other works, uh, but as far as I can tell from your presentation, there's not a lot of, well, or no other really didactic poems like you said where the the blending of the the content and the the style is there, and I find it interesting that it is then uh, still or has been attributed to Mavropoulos of all people. And you, I was also wondering, yeah, go ahead. Right. Sorry. No, 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 no. Well, sorry, I interrupted you, but you're right. And the, but the thing is that there is a difference. This poem was written by whoever, but was written for a didactic purpose. And in the economy of the narrative of the Maticanus Grecus 676, there there is no place for it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for the length and for the content. Uh, so it was not a poem that was reused in in education, but was a poem written for education. And this this fact could have caused the fact that it was transmitted separately. Yeah. And also due to its length, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a follow-up um, question uh, by Dan to Mara's question. Um, hey, thank you very much. Um, very, very interesting stuff um i'm curious about two things and you might have mentioned them but i broke off a lot due to a very poor connection um in the transmission so we have a corpus where the author supervised uh, its first form and we have those manuscripts you're right that's not common <laughs> um in the transmission um of of the corpus when it got broken off if this happened if you get excerpts from it if you get an abbreviated form of the corpus in the transmission what happens there is it clear what they shed off and why do we get um because i'm trying to follow up the consequences of the fact that we have a collection that is clear how it's supposed to be and then what people did with it and then apply that back to other corpora where we don't have did you see any patterns in how they dismembered in the transmission, the corpus, if they did. So um, the only witness for uh, this kind of um, discussion that we can have on how a corpus can be disrupted is um, the manuscript, the Parisinus manuscript. I don't remember. It was very, very famous. It's the one very, very, very famous that was written at the end. The one where also Nonos and other, other poems are. Um, uh, it was written at the end of the 11th or the beginning of the 12th century. Um, there you find the sequences. So it is clear that it's from the Vaticanus Greco 676 or similar collections that were going around Constantinople. So we have sequences and um, we can trace some um, interests towards some poems and not some other poems, but are they are idiosyncratic within this manuscript. Um, the reason why Mavropos was saved, I think, so the, the manuscript was saved, is for the quality itself, itself of the manuscript, and then for the love of Mavropos towards Theodoretus. And it was uh, very interesting that uh, the, um, it is linked to Theodoretus in, in in Crete, for instance. And this is very interesting because there is a poem um, where Mavropus um, reconsiders the position of Theodoretus in, in Orthodox tradition within the Vatican manuscript. Thank you, very, very interesting. And if I can follow up with something again, something you might have said already, do we have ancient translations of any kind? Translation. Ancient translations, yeah. No, we don't. Not at all. Nobody no. even tried to transpose the prosody and the nice no. things that from there. Okay. No, we don't. Thank we you. Don't. We we have uh, we have a uh, humanist, a Italian humanist, who writes, who reads and re re, re sorry read and reread 
the manuscript and we have a manuscript uh, um, his manuscript where he yeah. wrote the poems in a row as he read the poems and it is clear that he reread the, the the poetry book a couple of times but we don't have translations very interesting is that common for uh, this um, type and of authors of this time common for for Alatius, but it was mm. not yeah but yeah I don't know if it is was common to read and reread Mavropus at all. Mm -hmm. Well, I did. Bernard did, but I don't know how many others, apart from Mavropus. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Lara. Thank you very much for your um, presentation. It was very interesting. I, I was wondering, um, people doing editions are often painstakingly trying to reconstruct the authorial intention, while in your case, uh, you have it in front of you in a way. Um, what does that mean for an editor? How do you deal with the tradition that comes afterwards, uh, which in a way becomes text critically redundant or perhaps, but of course has also a story to tell. So I would like you to comment a bit on that. On, in my perspective, um, the tradition after the Vaticanus, so the tradition after the main manuscript, um, is to be addressed, um, and it, it, it is to be addressed, I think, by uh, monographic studies, so I'm thinking about articles. Um, as for the edition itself, um, well, it it's can not give anything to to the to the text and the text is uh, very well transmitted so the, the fact that the writer was also i didn't mention that but the copist was a close collaborator of mavropus and he was well trained in the nude greek uh, prevent prevented the fact that uh, there is there are errors in the transmission and so it, we have the best possible manuscript there. And for me, the, the other ways of transmission, they are part of a history of the text. So they are not, um, maybe they are not um, interesting for reconstructing the text with because we have the text, um, but they are very, very interesting to see, to, yeah, to see how a Byzantine author um, was used throughout the time. And I think um, what I wanted to, to point out in the last slide, um, functions, contexts in the plural form. Um, the Byzantine author had it, their readership, both as they intended to have it, and the ones that actually were in history. And I think Mavropos will never have um, would have never have uh, guessed that the transmission of his manuscript was linked to Theodoretus, for instance, and is very, very interesting. And there is also a wonderful manuscript in the Escorial that was composed for the emperor there, not the emperor of Constantinople, so the Fil uh, Filippo, um, Philip, sorry, um, that is very well illuminated and so on. And it, it is only the, the poetry book, for instance, with all the illuminations, but in Western side. So there is a, a an overview of how Byzantine texts were transmitted and were recep uh, and what was their reception throughout every period of Greek uh, between medieval and early modern period. Thank you very much. You're a very lucky editor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for you. this one, for this one, because the other ones that I'm editing, they are not in the same condition. And yeah, the poor Michael Coniatis and the, the poor Longibardos, they are not in the same conditions. Thank you. We have two um, questions. One is a follow-up done. So I, before I give the, uh, you can ask your question. In, in the modern, uh, brought up by Lara's question uh, to my mind, um, in, in the modern printing of the corpus, do you, because we have that nice situation, right, where, where it was uh, sent out with the intention of the authors. It, in modern editions, is it printed in that succession that there is in the 
No, yeah. they didn't modify it in yeah. any way, rearrange chronologically. Anyway, anyway, De La Carte did a good a good job at the time, although the edition is very, very old and should be substituted, but it did a very good job at the time. So we have the row and uh, it is possible to read it. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. I think it's muted. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We have a question from Georgia. Yeah, thank you very much. It's just a question out of ignorance. You already said a few things about it, but I was wondering whether we could expand just a little bit about the language itself of the author. Like, is it a very erudite kind of language, poetry? Does it change a lot? Can you tell us something more? So the poetry of John Mavropoulos, uh, Ioannis Mavropoulos, I would um, compare it to John Chrysostom. So it is very, very well sophisticated, very sophisticated, but it's very, very access accessible. And um, you can find this character, this feature, both in the dodecasyllabic poetry, so the, the poetry in high register and in high style, and in the hymns. In the hymns, you find a low, a more lowbrow form of language. In the dodecasyllabic poetry, you find a highbrow form of language but still it's very very accessible for a learned man uh, person in that time um, the hymns their lowbrow form wanted also to be uh, to to make the poetry accessible also to non-educated ones because the greek at the time was very different between the form it was used for literature and the form that was spoken and in anatolia even more. So uh, this was um, this is one feature. Uh, the other feature is that uh, if we read the prose, the prose is follow the same. So uh, follows the same. For instance, the epistles, we have a lot of references to some things, hints that the poet that that Mavropos wanted to write in order to be understood in the relationship between um, um, sender and addressee. Um, as common in epistolary writing in 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 Constantinople and in uh, the middle in the Middle Ages, and in orations we find a more accessible uh, oratory uh, language that can be understood by people, for instance, although very high quality oratory language. Yeah. Thank you. I think if we don't have any other questions, we can thank again our speaker, Hugo. Thanks very much. And um, I you. hope to see you soon uh, in Tetra again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Hugo. much. Thank you, everybody, for joining.